is trying to scare us all. Their predictions of temperature increase keep going down. In 1990, they said we were warming at 0.3 degrees per decade. 2001, they reduced it to 0.2. 2010, they reduced it to 0.15. Joanne and I have worked on this and we extrapolated their data. We reckon by 2020, they'll be saying it's not going up at all. <laughs> It'll still be red, though. And by 2025? <laughs> Alright, wrapping up now, very soon, we want to put this in a bit of context. This is the data from a Greenland ice core. The data is in blue, it goes back over the last uh, 11,000 years. This is the recent thermometer data in red, tacked on the end. Two points to notice. First of all, the temperature isn't particularly unusual for this interglacial period. And secondly, the rate of change of temperature, the recent warming, is not unusual either. I'd like to talk to you briefly about evidence, because people on the other side love to say they've got mountains of evidence. Well, there actually is no empirical evidence that carbon dioxide is the main, stress main, cause of the recent global warming. First of all, if there was, you would have heard all about their evidence. Instead, you hear about warming. And remember that the Western Climate Establishment has spent vast amounts of money looking for that evidence, and they haven't found it. What they will give you instead is the vast amounts of evidence that warming has been occurring. But logically, if the Arctic is warming, it could be due to Martians with ray guns. It doesn't necessarily mean that carbon dioxide did it. Models are not evidence. I'm a modeler. A model is equivalent to a guy punching furiously on a calculator. You do a lot of calculations, but it's just calculations. It's not evidence. Anything that happens in a computer is a calculation, not evidence. And so the evidence that we do get from the climate scientists is really just a calculation by fundamentally flawed models. So what evidence do they have? Until quite recently they had the ice cores as supporting evidence, but the newer ice cores, the high resolution ones that came out around the turn of the century, as Joanne pointed out, show the temperature rises before CO2. So they don't have that anymore. All they've got left is the notion, well, it must be carbon dioxide because we can't think of anything else. But the can't think business is a very selective sort of thing because what they really mean is that the government climate scientists furiously deny that anything other cause could have anything to do with it. And there's the, the old most climate scientists say business. Most Western climate scientists believe global warming is man-made. Is that true or false? No, it's true. It's true, but it's a bit murky. If you're in the Western climate establishment, or you're on the gravy train, your career flourishes if you support the theory. If you fight the theory, your career goes down the drain. At best, we can say it's a massive case of, bias, of confirmation bias. That is, you tend to accept and believe what confirms your theory, and you tend to vigorously deny or, or ignore what contradicts it. It came about because believers in the theory took over the funding body, bodies that control science. This is the problem in here. We've got a, a scientific method or a scientific establishment that's run badly. They took over the funding model, uh, sorry, funding bodies by about 1990. A lot of skeptics were fired and sidelined while Al Gore was vice president and ran the science area in the United States. And for two or three decades, in that, decades now, they've only been hiring people who believe in the theory, which means that every climate authority you will ever hear, every official so-and-so who's in climate science, always believe the theory. I mean, how could it be otherwise if you only hire people who believe the theory? The opposing climate scientists tend to be older, retired. Richard Linden is preeminent, very knowledgeable, and he's almost 70. The climate scientists who do speak up tend to be old and retired and no longer in receipt of government money, so they can say what they want. For example, Joanne Simpson is the world's first PhD in meteorology and became a very preeminent meteorologist. She worked for NASA, and in retirement, she said, since I am no longer affiliated with any organisation, nor receive any funding, I can speak quite frankly. As a scientist, I remain sceptical. That was her first speech after retirement. And finally, I'd like to finish on a slightly sour note. It's never going to change. There are no corrective mechanisms that exist in government-funded climate science. First of all, there's no competition from the private industry. There are no private bodies interested in long-range climate forecasts. There's no auditing like there are in the financial industries. There's no regulation like there is in the food and drug area. 
There's no resource op opposition like there is in a court case, there is in Parliament. None of these mechanisms we've set up in other areas have yet been set up in this very immature area. In climate science, the climate scientists can say what they like with no checking or oversight whatsoever. Anyone who speaks out from the inside of the climate industry <coughs> is under intense peer pressure to shut up. Their career takes a nosedive. And finally, any outsider who, who uh, speaks up against them gets denigrated and told to shut up. Perhaps no, none more so than our next speaker. <laughs>